In the last video, we introduced the synoptic problem. That is, who is copying from who in the gospel composition scenario? Which gospel was written first? Which gospel was written third, second? Which gospel was written third? In this video, we're going to address the two main solutions to the synoptic problem. So what we're going to do here is overview and present both of those solutions. And this, uh, these two solutions represent sort of what 99% of New Testament scholars hold to as answers to the synoptic problem. And then we're going to look at evidence in favor of each of those solutions separately from one another. So our first synoptic solution uh, is going to be the more popular of the two. This is the one that probably 60 to 70 percent of New Testament scholars would hold to. And this is called the two source theory. And the two source theory, uh, Mark is written first, that uh, concept known as Markane priority that we talked about in the last video. And Markane priority, remember, flips the uh, flips the script from what Augustine said. Augustine thought that Matthew was written first and that Mark used Matthew and sort of uh, epitomized Matthew, scrunched Matthew down into a smaller text. In the last video, we said that that probably wasn't likely because Mark would be leaving out a whole lot of really important material uh, if he was cutting out things from Matthew. So the two source, source theory starts with Markane priority and says that Matthew and Luke both use Mark independently of one another. So these lines are represent Mark going into Matthew, Markane material being reproduced uh, and reused and edited in Matthew and Markane material being reused and re-edited uh, in Luke as well. So this here would represent then what we called the triple tradition in our last video, those places where Matthew, Mark, and Luke all share material with one another. And I should also be clear for the sake of uh, being sort of comprehensive that triple tradition material also uh, includes anything that is shared between Mark and Matthew that's not in Luke and anything that's shared between Mark and Luke that's not in Matthew. There's not a whole lot of those, um, those places where uh, Mark and Luke are together uh, without anything in Matthew or Mark and Matthew are together without anything in Luke, but they do occur and that still counts as triple tradition. Um, so again, this is going to be our triple tradition, but in that last video we also talked about double tradition material. Those uh, episodes or passages that are shared between Matthew and Luke oftentimes uh, in nearly the exact same words as one another. And so this is where the second source comes in, from which the two source theory takes its name, the Q source, which is uh, short for Qella the German word for source. So under the two source theory, these scholars are going to say there was another document that existed that Matthew and Luke used independently of one another, just like they used Mark independently of one another. So we have lines of influence running from Q into Matthew. So that Q material goes into Matthew, Q material goes into Luke. And the most important thing to note about this chart here is that there are no lines running between Matthew and Luke. That Matthew and Luke are not looking at each other and may not, uh, are likely not even aware that each other exists when they are writing. So they're writing completely independently of one another using two different sources completely independently of one another. The other main solution to the synoptic problem is going to be what's called the Farer theory. And this is the less popular of the two most common solutions to the synoptic problem. Say probably 30 to 40 percent of New Testament scholars are going to hold to the Farer theory. And the Farer theory is going to have the same explanation for the triple tradition as does the two source theory. That is, Luke and Matthew both use Mark independently of one another so that Mark is Markane passages go into Luke and Markane passages also make their way into Matthew. What is different about the far theory is that their far theorists are going to dispense with the idea of Q all together and instead of uh, using Q as an explanation for the double tradition, the overlap between Matthew and Luke, they are going to have a line of influence running from Matthew into Luke. That is to say, Luke uses Matthew as well as Mark. So that the double tradition, the things that are shared between Matthew and Luke, uh, are explained by far theorists as Luke looking at Matthew and incorporating Matthew's material 
into, uh, into Luke's own gospel. So that the order of composition then in this scenario goes Mark writes first, uh, not using material. Matthew writes second, incorporating Marcane material. And Luke writes third, incorporating both Marcane and Mathean material. And so what we want to do now is sort of lay out the main evidence in support of both theories, the two source theory first and then the far theory second. So the first point of evidence in support of the two source theory is that there are Mathean and Lucane additions to Mark that are not shared with one another. So it, it appears as though Matthew and Luke are sort of adding things um, to Mark that when they don't appear in the, the other gospel, when we might expect them to if there was, uh, if either Luke was looking at Matthew or Matthew was looking at Luke. So for example, Matthew adds to Mark's temple cleansing. He gives more material to it, uh, but Luke doesn't contain this addition. Luke still has the temple cleansing, um, but does not contain the addition that Matthew uh, that Matthew gives to it. So two source theorists are going to say, well, if Luke is looking at Matthew and Mark, why wouldn't he why wouldn't he incorporate uh, some of these additions that Matthew has put into Mark? Uh, and they say instead, the better solution is that Luke doesn't know Matthew at all, and that's why. Uh, that's why Luke simply follows Mark rather than Matthew when there is added material to Mark from Matthew. And then the same thing sort of in the opposite direction, um, that Luke adds to Mark's transfiguration story, but these additions aren't in Matthew. Um, so that if, um, if Luke wrote uh, after Mark and then Matthew writes after Luke, uh, we would expect Matthew to perhaps know this addition to the transfiguration story, uh, but they're not in there, suggesting that Matthew is working completely independently of Luke and Luke is working completely independently of Matthew. Uh, similar to our argument for Marcane priority in the last video, there are some there are places in both Matthew and in Luke where if one was following the other, there are omissions that seem somewhat unlikely. Um, so this is the case, uh, especially when we see sort of passages in one uh, in either Matthew or Luke that really sort of reflect themes or ideas that the other gospel writer it, uh, really, really likes. So in the case of Matthew, Matthew has the account of the sheep and the goats, the separating of the sheep and the goats. Um, and Luke has this really strong concern for the poor that we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more in next week's videos. And this, this passage from Matthew 25 about separating out the sheep and the goats would really fit Fit well with Luke's concern for the poor. Uh, so two source theorists are going to say, why did Luke leave this out if he knows Matthew? The better explanation is that Luke didn't leave this out. He just simply doesn't know this story at all because he doesn't know Matthew. And then in the opposite direction, uh, Luke has a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector that's totally unique to Luke, not in Mark, not in Matthew. Um, which uh, sort of casts uh, the Pharisee in a bad light. And one of the things we'll see next week is that Matthew has this uh, really characteristic um, animosity towards the, the Jewish leaders and particularly the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So that um, if Matthew knew of Luke's existence or knew of the story's existence, it's really odd that he decided to leave this parable out. It's one that would, uh, would really fit with, math, with what Matthew is doing in Matthew gospel. And then uh, there's also this different placement of the Q material. So two source theorists look at what is shared between Matthew and Luke, and they sort of look at the order that it appears in each gospel uh, respectively. And what they find is that that double tradition, what, uh, what two source theorists are going to say is a result of Q, they find it at very different places in Matthew and Luke's gospel. And the thinking goes then, if Luke is using Matthew, 
Why is Luke not sort of following Matthew in the order of this material? If Luke follows Mark in the order of Jesus's ministry, of Jesus's death and resurrection, uh, very, very closely, so much so that we purport there must be literary influence. If Luke is doing the same thing with Matthew, following Matthew's gospel uh, from the text in a literary way, why is he taking part of uh, part of the unique things he finds in Matthew and putting them at the end of his gospel and taking other parts of what is unique to Matthew and putting them at the beginning of his gospel. Why is he not following the same order that he finds in, in Matthew? And then lastly, there is a sort of consistency to the double tradition or what uh, two source theorists are going to call the Q material that uh, in, in its language and style, um, in its order, and then also in its sort of theological and sociological concerns, there seems to be themes that run through this, uh, this double tradition material that aren't really themes of Matthew or of Luke or of Mark. They really seem to be themes that are peculiar to the double tradition material. And so two source theorists are going to say, well, this represents uh, many of the concerns of the author of this Q document, that this the author of this Q document um, was a part of a community and that this community had characteristic concerns and these sort of uh, made their way in to the writing of of Q, just as the concerns of Mark's community, and Mark is an author, and the concerns of Matthew's community, and Matthew is an author, and the concerns of Luke's community, and Luke as an author, are going to make their way into their portraits of Jesus in the gospel. So also, does this double tradition or Q material uh, have its own unique portrait of Jesus in the material that's there? So that is all the evidence in support, or not all the evidence, some of the best evidence in support of the two-source theory. Uh, here is our evidence in support of the far theory. Uh, perhaps the best evidence in support of the far theory is that there is absolutely no evidence for Q uh, whatsoever, as far as sort of real tangible evidence goes. We have no manuscripts of Q, no manuscript fragments of Q, and there's no early mention uh, of Q in the patristic writers. So whereas we'll see, you know, folks like Augustine remark on the different gospels and how they were composed and other patristic writers will do the same thing. None of these writers mention a another document uh, that that sounds anything like what scholars purport of, of, of Q to be. So the, the thinking goes then that the simplest solution, Occam's razor says the simplest solution is best. Uh, if we don't have evidence for Q, the best explanation for that is that Q did not exist and that the, the, the overlap between Matthew and Luke can best be explained by the simplest solution, namely that one was looking at the other. And for far theories, it's going to be that Luke was looking at Matthew. And another, uh, another point in favor of the far theory is that Matthew and Luke will often agree against Mark. So this is in the triple tradition where there is going to be uh, a passage in Mark, Matthew, and in Luke. And so remember here in the triple tradition, the idea is that Matthew and Luke are not looking at one another for the two source theory, that, uh, that Luke doesn't know Matthew at all. There's no lines of influence. Uh, so Matthew and Luke are looking at Mark independently of one another. Um, but then when you come to passages in the triple tradition, you find really, uh, really unique similarities between Matthew and Luke against Mark. So our example here is um, the mustard seed growing up and putting forth large branches. This is what Mark has. And Matthew has changed this to becomes a tree, and Luke also changes it to became a tree. So under the two document hypothesis, Matthew and Luke would have to be making these changes independently of one another. They both just coincidentally happened to change the large branches to becoming a tree and the making nets, nests uh, in its shade, they happened independently of one another to change the shade to branches. So far theorists are going to say that is far too coincidental uh, for Luke and Matthew to make the exact same change of something that seems somewhat um, 
unimportant um, and more likely under the fire theory, Luke is looking at both Mark and Matthew so that with these changes became a tree and in its branches, these reflect the changes that Matthew has already made to Mark in the triple tradition because Luke can look at Matthew's, uh, what Matthew does with a passage from Mark because Luke is making eye contact with Matthew's gospel while writing his own gospel. And then uh, there seems to be, uh, so if we want to uh, sort of defend the idea, the far, far theorists want to defend the idea that Luke uses Matthew and not Matthew using Luke. So the direction runs from Matthew being written and then Luke being written. There is a small major, uh, minority of scholars who actually want to reverse this and say it goes Mark, Luke, Matthew. Uh, but it's such a, a narrow perspective, a small group that, uh, that we're not going to address it in this video. But uh, for far theorists, it's just the opposite that Luke uses Matthew. Um, and the reasons that far theorists think this, uh, one is that Matthew doesn't claim to use any other sources. Remember in Luke 1, 1 through 4 in the preface, we talked about this uh, previously, that Luke makes mention of other people already writing up accounts of Jesus and that Luke is doing the same thing. So Luke's sort of knowledge of other sources seems to apply uh, that, that Luke is working with other sources, probably in the plural. Um, and then there's also these sort of memorable parables in Luke that wouldn't likely be omitted by Matthew. So some of, uh, some of the most famous sort of parables uh, from Jesus's ministry, things like the Good Samaritan, only occur in Luke. It's just... Uh, by their nature, they're just really good stories, uh, some of Jesus' most famous stories. So it's, it seems odd that Matthew would leave out some of these really, really good, uh, some of the really, really good stuff, as it were. It's like taking uh, a Greatest Hits album and taking out some of the best of the Greatest Hits from the Greatest Hits album. And then the last, uh, the last point of evidence for the far theorists, and this one is a little bit more convoluted and a little bit more, um, goes into the weeds a little bit more. But this is a, an idea that's called editorial fatigue. And this is uh, an idea presented primarily by Mark Goodacre, uh, who you're reading some from this week. And what editorial fatigue uh, does, first it supports Markane priority because we're going to see this phenomenon both in the way that Matthew and Luke deal with Mark, um, but there are also in ways in which the concept can be used to show that Luke uh, is dependent on Matthew. So what editorial fatigue is, is when a uh, an author who is using a text sort of uh, uses part of the texts and forgets that, they, uh, that they've changed something. So oftentimes what Matthew and Luke will do at the beginning of a Markane account, so they'll take a passage from Mark and they'll change the way that Mark starts it in some way. And then as the episode progresses, they'll include more material from Mark. And sometimes the material that they include from Mark won't make sense based on the changes that they have made to the beginning of the episode. So what I'm going to do first is show you examples of Matthew fatiguing on Mark, where this happens. Uh, Luke doing the same thing, where he where they change the beginning of a Markane episode, and then something later doesn't make sense. And then lastly, a potential uh, case of Luke fatiguing while copying Matthew, where Luke is going to change something from Matthew's beginning and then copy from Matthew and what Matt Luke has copied not make sense based on the changes that were made earlier. So first we're going to start with a case of where Matthew appears to uh, fatigue on Mark. That is to say he changes the beginning of Mark and then, uh, then includes something from Mark and doesn't edit a Accordingly. So his editorial fatigue, his editorial tiring comes when he copies the material later on. So this is as close as I can get here, uh, but what we're going to do is highlight the features uh, of the editorial fatigue here. So here in the healing of a leper uh, that's in the triple tradition, so contained in Mark, Matthew, and in Luke, um, a leper comes to Jesus uh, begging him to, to heal him. And Jesus in Mark 
uh, and very characteristic of Jesus in Mark, uh, sternly warns uh, sternly warns the leper not to say anything to anyone uh, about what Jesus did for him, but to go off and go to the priests and offer uh, your cleansing what Moses commanded. When Matthew uh, takes Mark, what he does is he changes the beginning of Mark. So notice here, if you can see my cursor, uh, what Matthew has at the beginning of the passage is not contained in Mark. So this is material that Matthew has added here. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. So now what Matthew does is he places Jesus with a bunch of crowds. There are no crowds in, in Mark. Uh, we're, we're given no indication that there's other people around. That in the Marcane account, it seems that it's just the leper and Jesus or the leper Jesus and Jesus' disciples. Matthew changes this for crowds to be there, which is something Matthew often does, that there's a lot of crowds around Jesus all the time in, in Matthew. And then uh, when Matthew copies over from Mark, over here, Jesus says to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. So very much taking over what Mark says. But this comment doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Don't say anything to anyone. Don't let the secret out if there's already a bunch of people there, right? So that the idea is that uh, Matthew has sort of changed this but then when he uh, copied this over, he didn't edit this accordingly to be in line with the, the crowds that were already present uh, at the healing of the leper in this account. So a case of uh, this again with Matthew fatiguing on, on Mark. So a second case of it here. This is the account of John the Baptist being beheaded. In, uh, in Mark, we have this this material in Mark that is not present in Matthew. Um, and the material in Mark here is uh, Herodias having a grudge against John the Baptist um, and wanting to kill John the Baptist. But Herodias is not able to do this because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. So Herod protects John, and Herod likes uh, to hear John. He liked to listen to him. So Matthew takes this bit out about Herod protecting John and Herod liking to hear John. And so then at the end of Mark, uh, when Herod's hand is sort of forced and uh, he ends up having to behead John on account of the oaths that he made, um, when this gets copied over in Matthew, what we find is uh, Matthew changes this bit from Mark. Mark has nothing here about Herod wanting to put John to death. Matthew tells us that Herod wants to put John to death. But then later on, at the end, towards the end of the story, when Matthew copies over um, this bit from Mark about the king being deeply grieved uh, for regard of his oaths and for his guests, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, because we don't have any of this any of this stuff about Herod actually liking John. Uh, so the comment here is a bit out of place compared uh, because of the change that Matthew has made up here. And we also have similar cases where uh, Luke appears to fatigue while copying Mark. So in this case, we have the healing of the paralytic. In Mark, you can see that both Luke and Matthew removed this bit about uh, many being gathered around so that there is not room for them, not even in front of the door. And this is the reason that the, uh, the friends of the paralytic are not able to bring him to Jesus. Uh, it's because of the crowd and because so many people were gathered around the house in Mark. Um, and in Luke, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have this bit about there being so many people there. But Luke still does include uh, the comment about not being able to uh, be able to bring the paralytic men in because of the crowd. Um, so this is a case where Luke has sort of uh, sort of fixed um, or has uh, has has not included this bit up here, um, sorry, this bit up here of, um, from Mark about the crowd, but does repeat it down here. So there's no crowd here, uh, but the repetition of the crowd from Mark does in fact occur. Um, and so Luke doesn't presume the crowd the way that Mark does, but still includes information about the crowd. 
So then the payoff here for far theorists is they're going to point to occasions where it appears that Luke might be fatiguing while copying Matthew. That is taking something from the beginning of Matthew, changing it, and then something later in Luke not making quite as much sense because that change has not been uh, sort of embedded consistently throughout Luke's passage. So I'm going to give you one example uh, of this here, and you can judge for yourself whether you think it is um, a convincing case of Luke fatiguing on Matthew. So this comes from the parable of the talents or pounds. Uh, it's two different words in Matthew and Luke, talents in, in Matthew and pounds in Luke. And so in Matthew, what happens is uh, the, the master uh, summons three different slaves. Uh, he gives one five talents. He gives another two talents. He gives another one talent. And then in Luke, uh, the, the master summons 10 different slaves and gives them 10 pounds, presumably one pound each. And then in Matthew, when the reckoning comes, the master comes back and sees what the different slaves has done. Uh, to the one that got five talents, this man, this slave comes forward and says, here's your five talents, here's five more for five plus five equals 10 talents total. When it comes to Luke, the first one comes back and says, your pound, your single pound has made 10 more pounds. 10 plus one equals 11. And then when we come towards the end of the passage here, what we find in Matthew is that the master rebukes the wicked and lazy slave saying, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents, referring back to the slave who had five talents, got five more for a grand total of 10. When Luke seems to sort of take this over from Matthew, he says the same thing. Take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. Far theorists are going to point to this and say, but there's no one who has 10 pounds in this story. The closest is the slave who has 11 pounds uh, because he had one pound and got 10 more. So this is a case where it appears that perhaps Luke is taking over this phrase from Matthew, changing it just a little bit from talents to pounds, and has forgotten uh, or has not included the fact that they changed the story earlier for it to be um, the each slave getting one pound each. So in Luke, there's no one that has 10 pounds. In Matthew, there is someone that has 10 pounds. And this bit about someone in Matthew having 10 pounds seems to be further reflected in Luke. So all of this is to say uh, there are two main solutions to the synoptic problem, uh, the two document hypothesis and the FAR theory. And what I want you to do to conclude this video here is take a lecture pause and in bullet point format, so uh, not extensively here, listing out the two main uh, two main solutions to the synoptic problems and then some of the pieces of evidence in support of each that have been presented in this video. So what you're doing in this lecture pause is a recap in bullet point format.